Well, we're in lesson 12, and we are going to focus in on a specific verse in the Torah, Genesis 4.1. And it just so happens that it says that Adam knew his wife, and they had a son. And we're going to be talking about the word no, and we all know that the biblical word no can mean sexual intercourse. Well, the actual Hebrew word is yada. And it's conceptual in meaning. The best thing you can do to try to define a Hebrew word is to understand the concept. And the concept here is seeing. So in other words, that implies that this knowledge has something to do with the fact that you see something and it's close to you or it's present in front of you. In other words, it's an experience. You see something. So it's an experiential knowing. And what's amazing, when we go into Hebrew and we understand this word yada, we see that this conceptual word is also related to our way of life. It's related to our relationship with Jesus and our walk with him. But on top of that, yada, again, is also related to eternal life. I ask you the question. Think about it. What is eternal life? You're, you're going to get the answer in this session. What is eternal life? It's related to yada. It's related to this word that first appears in Genesis 4.1 with the conceptual meaning of seeing. So curious? Interested? Come. Let's begin. So now, let's begin Genesis chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4, again reading from Fox's translation. Now the human knew Chava, his wife, and she became pregnant and bore a Cain. She said, Kaniti, I have gotten a man, as has Yahweh. Stop. Now I have to talk about this verse. It was very interesting to me that Genesis 3.24 and Genesis 4.1 are so close to each other. You have to realize that uh, in Jesus' day there, were no, there was no numbering system. So when you read Genesis 3.24, you go to Genesis 4.1 immediately, there's no break whatsoever, no break in the chapters at all. Now, in Genesis 4.1, we read about a concept called uh, that uh, Adam knew his wife. Okay, and you'll hear this, I know you've probably heard it in your life, biblical knowing, whoa, okay. So he knew his wife, uh, not only in Genesis 4.1, but he knew her again in 4.17, uh, no, Cain knew his wife, uh, and then in 425, Adam knew his wife again, and in all three instances, babies were born. So we know what biblical knowing is, okay? And biblical knowing happens to be sexual intercourse in marriage. The Hebrew word there is yada. And again, the uh, Strong's number is H3045. However, yada does not mean sexual or intercourse. Remember, a Hebrew word is conceptual in meaning. It always gives you a picture, okay? You, it does not have a definition. So I'm not going to go through all of that right now, but I'm going to show you different applications of the conceptual application of yada, okay? Who uses the word the first time in the Bible? Satan. Let me give you the verse. This is in Genesis, chapter 3, verse 5. This is the first appearance of the word. Satan, let me go to verse 4. The snake said to the woman, die, you will not die. 
Rather, God knows. Yada. That's not sexual intercourse. It's yada. Okay? That on that day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God's knowing good and evil. Here's another place. I'll just give you the verse. You can look it up on your own. Genesis 25, 27. Esau, as your Bible says, was a cunning hunter. It doesn't say that. He was a hunter with Yada. In other words, he was a child prodigy. So when you have a child prodigy on piano, they have Yada in piano. That's, you get the idea? It's an intimate knowing. It's, it's almost second nature. It's an experiential knowing. It's not, like for instance, I know that I've got a can of 7-Up right here. Okay? I know that. I know that because I don't want to knock it over with my shoe. It doesn't affect me whatsoever. But the thing is, is that my friend Bruce is here. And my friend Bruce is here. We have Yada. Yada is friends. We know things about each other. None of you know. We've talked privately about a lot of different things in our lives, and we have Yada to a degree. Okay? And Bruce has brought his beautiful Rachel tonight, and they're both here. And there's a yada they have between them that is obviously none of our business. Okay? It's not only physical, it's mental, it's emotional, and spiritual. It's a whole, the whole thing. Okay? So yada is bigger than we thought. Now, the reason why I want to bring this up is I want to go to Matthew chapter 7. Again, when Jesus is speaking, we're reading in English, it was translated from the Greek, and he's speaking Hebrew over and over and over again, and again, there are a number of excellent scholarly uh, arguments that, sh that would show that the common language of the day was Hebrew. Aramaic was around, I won't go into all that details, it was there, but it was Hebrew. So if we go to Matthew 7, Matthew 7, starting in verse 21. Now remember what Yada means. It's an experiential knowing. And Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Yada. This is not just knowing. This is knowing. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, if you take it to the Hebrew, Jesus is saying, I never had yada in you. Depart from me, you who neglect to do the Torah. Then we go again. So what's Jesus doing? He's seeking more than friendship. And already in the New Testament, we know that we're called the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ. We're waiting for the marriage of the Lamb. We're engaged. This is not about religion again. This is about relationship. He's saying it. These are the very words of God. This is Yada. This is that intimate relationship with him. John 17, 3. There's another good one. In John 17, 3, I remember asking this of the pastors uh, in Africa, and I said, what is eternal life? And they had a lot of different answers, and God actually specifies what it is. John 17, 3, Jesus' own words, God's own words, the very words of God, and he said, this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Yada. Everlasting life is having yada with the Father. And again, like I said, we're engaged to our lover, the lover of our soul. 
However, I want to show you some other things, the application of Yada. I'll give you the verses, you can look them up on your own. Exodus 6, 7 and 16, 12. Exodus 6, 7 and 16, 12. When you read it in the Hebrew, God wanted Israel to have Yada in him. He wanted Israel to know him. Yada, a deep experiential relationship with him. Do you understand that that's what they got? Think about it. In Exodus chapter 3, oh, Exodus chapter 2, I'm sorry, they cry out to no one. Seriously, in Exodus chapter 2, to read about it, they cried out to who? No one. It just so happens God is listening, and he already has a plan. He's going to come and get them. So he heard their cry, all right, but they didn't cry out to Yahweh. It doesn't say that. Exodus 14, when they're about ready to cross the Red, uh, the, the Red Sea, okay, they're crying. Well, they didn't do that because Moses hadn't parted it yet. Uh, by putting the staff uh, over the sea as God commanded him. But it was before that when Pharaoh's army and the chariots are there, they cried out, but this time it says, they cried out unto Yahweh. They cried out to him. So here's God giving an experiential relationship with him, Yada. But guess what? He wanted to do the same thing with the Egyptians. The <laughs> Yada, it is just amazing when we start applying this. I mean, we go all the way to Jesus, and he's saying, if, I've never, I never had Yada with you. I don't know you. We don't have a relationship. We're not walking with each other. You're not my bride. You're not engaged to me. You go to church, you read your Bible, and so on. Big deal. I don't know you. He wanted the same thing for the Egyptians. Here's the verses. Ex There's a lot of them. I'll give you three. Exodus 7, 5. Exodus 14, 4. And Exodus 14, 18. 7, 5, 14, 4, and 14, 18. He wants the Egyptians to have Yada in him. Just like Israel. But guess what? He wants the same thing for Pharaoh. He wants Pharaoh to have Yada in him. He wasn't angry with Pharaoh. Oh, he was angry with Pharaoh, but not angry to, with he want He loved him. Here's the verses for Pharaoh. Exodus 7, 17. 9, 14. Exodus 10, verse 2. God wanted Yada with Israel. He wanted Yada with the Egyptians. He wanted Yada with Pharaoh. And then we come to an amazing verse. And this is why I did this to you guys. Here's Exodus, I mean Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And I think it's about the third time Yada is used in the Torah. I think it's used a couple more times prior to this. And I just had to take you there because... This is how I learned about all of this that I'm teaching you over the past 10 years. The concept of Yada I have taught year in and year out, and it stemmed from one person mentioning to me in Genesis 4.1 that Yada does not necessarily mean having sex as a man, as a husband and wife. I said, really? And they started explaining it. And then we went to G, and it just exploded over these years. Because you guys, it's related to Genesis 3.24. You're not getting in unless you're married to him. That's it. Very cut and dry, period. John, and you know this, and I have to read it again because of the wording. I want you to hear the wording. Very famous verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, except Cain. Oh, I'm sorry, let me read it again. For God so loved the world, except Pharaoh. 
I'm, I'm sorry. For God so loved the world, except the Egyptians. For God so loved the world, except Judas. doesn't say that. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have... What's eternal life? Yada! Jesus said it. Argue with him. The very words of God. There's a concept here. And John gets it. Not only does he, inspired by God, to write this, well, actually, he's hearing Jesus actually say this, then we go to his letter, 1 John, listen to these words, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, and the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Yada. And then we go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. And I'm going to read 3 through 6. Listen to this. And by this we know, yada, we have come to know him, yada. How? If we keep his commandments. Which ones? All of them. Because there's no commandments in the New Testament. None. When Jesus says, I'm going to give you a new commandment, the Greek basically means, uh, I'm going to give you a tweaked commandment, a new version on an old commandment. And he did. Love one another. Right? Complete the phrase. As I have loved you. Thank you. As I have loved you. It's Leviticus 19.18. Love your neighbor as yourself. How have I loved you? I died for you. He didn't give a new commandment. He just said, I'm going to expand something that's very old. Matter of fact, love your neighbor as yourself is the second greatest commandment by Jesus' own words. That's all he's doing. He's a rabbi in those days. The one who says, I've come to know him, yada, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know, no, 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 yada, 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 that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought to walk in the same manner as he walked. Oh, wow. That is a standard phrase used for discipleship. Follow the rabbi, walk as he walked. Being a disciple means that you have yada in him. And then there's the marriage of the Lamb, Revelation 19.7. You've heard this before, but there's the verse. You can read it. Wife, the bride, is preparing for the marriage of the Lamb. So full circle. Tekun olam. He's coming to fix everything. Like Adam and Eve, being with Adonai in Gan Eden, He's coming. And when he comes, there's going to be the messianic age and the messianic kingdom. We're going home. We're going home. We're going home. Wow. To me, I just had to share these two verses with you. I thought I'd be done with uh, Genesis chapter 8 tonight. 
we're still stuck here back and forth. Um, amazing, amazing stuff. Now, we continue to go on in chapter 4. And basically what I'm going to do is introduce you to our next session. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a cliffhanger. I don't want to go through all the details of Cain killing Abel and who sacrificed. Again, what I'm attempting to do, you guys, is this. As we take a look at chapter 4, and there's a lot of things in 4. This is not a comprehensive Torah class. I have to say this for sure. When we're getting into the Hebrew, we're getting into the history, we're getting into the culture, we're going to get into polemics again real soon about the Hebrews and the flood. Wait till you see that. We're on our way to that. Um, polemics against Egypt. I know for a fact that I never knew this and nobody was teaching it. Nobody. Nobody knew ancient Egypt, and, but the Hebrews did. And Dr. Conor, Dr. John Curry did, and all of a sudden this is exploding. God is using the culture. And so for me to do that, to show you the Hebrew, we looked at some of these verses already. And I've, all, I've heard over and over and over again over my years where they would say, oh yes, but in the Chumash, the Orthodox rabbis would say X, therefore it must be true. I'm sorry, I disagree. The Orthodox Jewish rabbi said that today, we read it, that if Adam did not sin, he would have lived forever because of his holiness. The Torah doesn't say that. I bless these guys. But I have to really disagree because the Torah says, by God's own words, God's saying it, if they eat of the tree of life, it's got nothing to do with their holiness, they'll live forever in their sin. I don't want that to happen. Something's wrong here. So what I want to do is make sure that we enhance what we know. I don't want to teach you what you know already. Cain killed Abel. Really? Okay. Here's a new piece. Cain's name in Hebrew is Cain. Okay. Abel's name is Hevel. That's it. Cain and Hevel. So let's learn something new tonight. Okay. But that's not that important. But I want to clarify the text, and I want basically for you guys to promote further study. This is God's word. <coughs> I remember when I was in Mexico the last time and I was teaching the students there at the Bible Institute. We went down the Pacific. And at the Pacific, they were all standing around. And I walked down to the shore and the waves were just pounding in. It was sunset. And I scooped up a cup of water. And I came up and I said, do this every day. This is the study of God's word, living water. And I said, do you think you can drain the ocean? No, that's God's word. It's too deep. It's too, this is God. There's no final answer. You want to be an expert on the Torah? You can never be, period. None of you can. I can't. All we can do is keep on saying, this is God. It's amazing stuff. So, as we're going to come into next week, I'm going to focus on three verses next week. Just three. I'll tell you what the three are, and then we'll cut it off. Genesis 4.9. I don't know where he is. Am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> what does he mean by that? What's going on? We have to take a look at that. The next verse we're going to take a look at, if I can find it very quickly, is Genesis 4.10. And in Genesis 4.10, it talks about your brother's blood cries out for me from the ground. And then the last one we'll take a look at is Genesis 4.13. And this is it. We don't read the Hebrew. Your version, versions probably say, Cain is saying, my punishment is too great to bear. It doesn't say that in Hebrew. If you read it in Hebrew exact Hebrew it implies that Cain was repenting but you need to know the Hebrew not the English wait till we get there amazing and then we're gonna deal with a lot of other stuff yet too because we get those three verses out of the way but indeed you guys tonight the good news 
the gospel according to Moses. We're going home. We're going home. He opened the way back to the Father, to the tree of life, and we need to have Yada in him. Amen? Amen. So that ends session 12. And for me, it has become extremely fun. After I took my graduate class in the Hebrew language, a Hebrew language study skills, Bible study skills, love to focus in on the conceptual meanings of the Hebrew words like yada. Jesus is teaching us that if we're true Christians, if we're true disciples of his, it means our we have this desire to have yada of him or in him. An intimate experiential relationship that he's part of us and that we're part of him. There's an interesting verse the night before Jesus died in the last in his last supper in the messianic Passover in the Passover meal of the Messiah. It's, an, it's noted in John 14 20, and Jesus says that in that day you will know, there it is, Yada, in that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. That word Yada, an, an experiential knowing. It's not just going to be knowing. But it's an experiential knowing. In that day, you, you're going to have an experiential idea that I'm in the Father and you're in me and I in you. In other words, we're going to be wrapped up in Jesus. And Jesus wrapped up and together, we're going to be twisted together with Adonai. <sighs> Amazing. So we're going to be coming into Lesson 13. And in Lesson 13 of the Gospel According to Moses, we're going to be focusing in on Genesis 4.1 through Genesis 4.13. And these are the famous verses of the Cain and Abel story. Now we're going to have to ask ourselves some interesting questions. Did Cain understand that he murdered Abel? It's the first time we see somebody killed by somebody else intentionally. I mean, this is not an accident. This is this is not premeditated murder either, so it's second-degree murder. But at that time, there was no law against murder. God had not set up his law that he did at Sinai, talking to Moses that said that anybody that kills anybody else intentionally, first or second-degree murder, must be executed. So that's God's standard, but he did not execute Cain. And it was second-degree murder. So we ask, why? Well, is the answer because Cain really didn't understand what this is all about? God was kind of giving him some mercy and compassion? It could very well be. Or is there something else we can't see? Because it's written in Hebrew. This is something that would enhance our understanding if we only could get to the Hebrew word. The answer? Yep. <laughs> Guess I'll see you guys in Lesson 13. And we'll remember in Luke 24, 50 that Jesus lifted up his hands to bless his 120 disciples before he ascended the Father, just like the high priest daily lifts up his hands. It could very well be that Jesus blessed them with the ironic blessing. I've taken the ironic blessing and I've turned it into a prayer. And I'd like to end our session with that blessing. That blessing that's based upon the high priestly blessing that God gave to Moses, to Aaron, to bless the people. Yevarekeinu. Adonai Vishmarkenu, Yair Adonai Panava Alenu, Vekunakenu, Isa Adonai Panava Lenu, Viasem Lanu Shalom, Vishem Yeshua Adonenu, Amen. So together, let's say this in English. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and may he give us his shalom. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.